Welcome to Module 1 of the JCPS series on PBIS. In this first module, the focus is on simply describing PBIS and the logic behind it. The idea is that all involved with PBIS should have a good understanding of what it is, what its purpose is, what it means to be a PBIS school, and most importantly, what is involved. Just to clarify, PBIS is focused on behavior, and when the same logic is applied to academics, it is called Response to Intervention, or RTI. When both PBIS and RTI are implemented together, it most often is referred to as Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, or MTSS. The term PBIS does not refer to a curriculum. There are no specific activities, lessons, or products to purchase. Rather, PBIS is a framework for selecting, implementing, and evaluating school-wide practices to promoting successful behavior for all students in the school. Because every missed opportunity for success is a potential failure. Both efficiency and effectiveness are key considerations within PBIS. That is, we are concerned with the simplest manner in which we may reasonably predict student success. The tiered part of PBIS applies to increased levels of intervention as necessary for individuals who are not experiencing success. Well, we used a, um, a universal screener um, to identify which students we felt like um, fell into the tier two and tier three categories so we could be very specific and targeted about the type of interventions um, that they got. Um, with regard to the personality of that student and what we thought would work best for them, rather than just you know, all tier three students get this or all tier two, two students get that. Mm -hmm. We use our um, hero, we have the hero system, and we use the point system with that. With the negative points, we look at students um, from the prior month and we look to see has a student moved from one to the other group. So if they've gotten a, a lot less negatives, then you know that's really awesome. But if we see a student who's consistently received this many points and then now they're moving down, um, we use that to kind of inform our next steps. PBIS has been widely implemented in schools across the U.S. and around the world. Identified as an evidence-based practice by the U.S. Department of Education, PBIS has been exhaustively studied and found to be associated with a decrease in student misbehavior and a general increase in both staff and student satisfaction with the school. In JCPS, PBIS has been implemented in many schools with equally successful outcomes. The logic behind PBIS is all about prevention first through effective instruction. The following video presents a couple of very basic analogies to help clarify this logic for PBIS. I want to talk about predictability for kid behavior. And this is based off of some of the research that we've been doing over the past several years looking at can you predict what a kid's going to do later based upon what they've been doing now. So to start with that, I want you to think about the average kid. So the only way you can really think about the average kid is by thinking about all kids. So if you were to assess all kids on anything, they're gonna fall out about like this. This is a normal curve. Two thirds of all your kids are right in the middle, less than a standard deviation away from the mean. That's your average. What we are gonna be concerned with is, can we predict kids that are not average? Can we predict kids that will be on this end or this end of that curve. Now, when you're over there on the right side of that curve, that's where we wanna be. Those are kids that are really doing well or doing spectacularly. And although sometimes people say, we'd like to have everybody be above the mean. That is illogical. You can't have everybody be above average. That makes no sense. You're always going to have some that are ahead and some that are behind. This is the question. Can you predict where those kids will be in the future based upon where they are now? And the answer is maybe. It's a better predictor of where were they and which direction did they move? So I want you to think about this normal curve like a snow hill, which is far more interesting than a normal curve. 
and I'm going to come to your school, and I'm going to pick a kid at random from your roll book. So I'm just going to close my eyes and pick a kid. Bet. Gamble. Where will the kid that I pick fall on that curve? In the middle, because that's your best bet. There are more of those kids. So let's say I walk into your school, I pick a kid at random. I'm going to represent that kid with a snowball. We pick the absolute average normal kid. That kid is represented by a snowball sitting on the top of that little bitty peak there, and this is what we know. Snowballs in nature don't sit still. They tend to move. And once they move, it predicts movement. What do we know about snowballs that roll down a hill? They get bigger, they get heavier. And according to, I think it's Newton's third law, Bigger and heavier mean rolling faster when it's going down a hill. Let's go back to Newton's first law. An object moving in any direction in space is going to continue moving in that direction unless something stops it. So that is fantastic news for us as long as that snowball is rolling the right direction. So here's what I could do on the very first day of school. If I were thinking in terms of prevention, prevention to predict, I might start like this. Amy comes in the school on the first day, and I'm not going to let Amy have a problem. I'm going to go in and be proactive with instruction and set her up. So I come running in and I say, Amy, glad you're here today. Did you know we walk in the hall here? That's how we stay safe. Come with me. Hey, that's great walking. Where'd you learn to walk like that? You're one of the best. I'm glad you're in our school because we need walkers like you. Now Amy's going, well, I didn't know I was a good walker, but that's pretty cool. On the first day of school, I kicked her snowball in that direction. Notice what happened to her snowball. It got bigger, and here's what that means. Every single time a kid is successful with anything you ask them to do in school, statistically increases the probability of another success. Success predicts success. How much success do you need to predict a whole lot of success? It depends but more is better. So I want Amy's snowball to get so big that I don't need to walk around behind her saying, hey, you're a good walker. I want her to hear it so much early on that she internalizes that and she believes it and she just does it. This is what we want. I want that snowball to get so big that it rolls right out of school and keeps rolling without teachers doing something. This is what happened to all of us. We started out reading with people teaching us reading right here, and they taught reading until they didn't have to teach it anymore because we just kept rolling. Nobody ever says to you anymore, good reading, but they did back here. And once you believed you're a good reader and it was working for you, you didn't need that anymore. Our goal is to make kids so successful that they don't need us anymore. So go back to this big idea. Every success predicts a success. Here's a logic for that. I'm coming to your school tomorrow. I would like to watch a kid be successful all day long. If the kid that I watch tomorrow is successful all day long, every adult in this school gets $10,000. Which kid would you like me to watch? Can I pick the kid or do you have one in mind? Logically, you're thinking, I want you to watch that kid that's had 50,000 successes because he or she has a better probability than the kid that's had five. Success predicts success. Unfortunately, it works the same way on the other side of that curve. Let this be kid walking in on the first day and I've heard people say this. I'm not going to teach them to walk in the hall or say thanks for walking in the hall. They're old enough to know that. Okay, I agree, they are, but what if they don't? So I do this on the first day. I'll stand back and I'll watch for kids that aren't walking, and when I find kids that are running, I will beat the run out of them. <laughs> Which doesn't work very well, but this is what we see all the time. So first day, I'm just eyeballing Amy, waiting for her to make an error so I can teach. So I wait. Amy comes in. She's real excited to be here on the first day of school. She comes running down the hall and I stop her. Hey, 
We do not run in the hall here, we walk. And I'm going to be keeping an eye on you, runner. And I do this on the first day of school, her snowball rolled left. That's not a good place for us. Go back to the question. How much success do you need to predict success will keep going? And the answer is, it depends on where you are on that curve. For kids that are in the middle, less than a standard deviation away from the mean, four or five successes for every failure is a great predictor of a snowball that'll roll that way. Kids that are way down here at the bottom, they can fail a whole bunch of times in a row and they'll keep trying. As snowballs start to roll this way, that doesn't work. The best data we have out there right now says, if you're dealing with a kid whose behaviors are more than one standard deviation in deficit, they will need 14 successes for every failure in order to predict their snowball will turn and roll that way. So if you think four to one is really hard, which is what we generally ask for in PBIS as a school-wide thing, the kids that it doesn't work for are going to need a lot more, and that's going to be really hard. We aren't good at changing these kids once that snowball goes a little farther down the hill. In my area, emotional behavior disorders, we would say that once a snowball gets to be this big, at any age level, two standard deviations different from their peers, at any age level, we would say treat these kids like they have diabetes you aren't going to get rid of behavior disorders. You've got to teach them ways to live with what they have. That's a really sad, kind of scary thing to say, but that's the reality. We aren't good at changing kids that have gone this far down the hill. And that's not really just behavior. We've got that same data for reading and math. Show me a kid in the fourth grade who's a poor reader, not a non-reader, a poor reader. A kid in the fourth grade who's a poor reader has a 0.88 probability of being a poor reader for the rest of their life, no matter what we do. Sorry, that's the reality. So what we have to be thinking about all the time is, one, how do I not let a kid's snowball start rolling that way in the first place? Don't wait to nip it in the bud, don't let it bud. Teach them from the moment you see them what makes them successful. I believe this is what teachers are. We set kids up to be successful, kick them into doing that, and give them the credit for it. That's what we're doing all day long. That's your credit. They feel good about themselves and their snowball rolls that way. But if you set this all up, well, we'll just sit back in our school and wait to see kids that fail and then go work on them. Well, one, you're gonna have a lot more kids to work on, and two, it doesn't work as well on this side. Now, actually, we are pretty good at moving these snowballs, but honestly, we're just not very good at these ones. So, logical, again, I'm coming to your school tomorrow. I wanna to see a kid have problems. If the kid I look at is having problems, you get $10,000. If you all work in the same school, every one of you is thinking of the same kid right now. You know who that kid is. It's predictable. The more problems you have, the more predictable it becomes. So what we need to be thinking about is, what things do we have at our disposal as adults who work in schools that we know move snowballs that way? Although I think in education we ask the wrong question. We say, what would move a snowball that way? And that's not the right question. The right question is, of all the millions of things that are out there and for sale, et cetera, which ones do we know move them the most with the highest probability? What, what could I do tomorrow? If there was $10,000 of your money riding on this, what would you want to see done tomorrow? And you wouldn't just say, oh, there's a million things, pick one of them. No, there's $10,000 riding on it for me. You'd say, I want the thing that I know gives me the best chance of winning that money. And those things are practices we know about they're not things we don't know about, but it's all a probability, it's a gamble. So I like to think of when I'm thinking about PBIS in schools, we're just handicapping for a bet. The bet is, if these kids are successful, you win. 
then what kinds of things do you want to do in order to win that bet? But nothing that you do is going to work for every kid or every time. Nothing. Some things, however, work better than others and give you a lot better chance. So if I said, if this kid is successful tomorrow, you guys get a lot of money. And that's her teacher. What do you want her teacher to do tomorrow? You wouldn't go, eh, whatever. You'd go, no, there's 10,000 on this for me. You'd better do this. You'd be really adamant about some things work better than others. It's a probability statement. So we take that logic and we apply it to PBIS, the whole school. Tier one. What are those things that we could gamble on at tier one that we believe would make every single kid in the school as successful as possible? We'll call that the green part. That represents every kid in the school. What are those things that we know maximize our probability of success? Put them in place, get everybody to do it. We're teaching kids, we're reminding kids, we've dictated out where, our, where we should be standing and what we should be saying to make that probability high. Then we look and we collect data and we find there will be some kids it's not working for and those kids will need something extra. On the PBIS triangle, we represent tier two with yellow for whatever reason. That means some kids will need something extra. But hear that word extra. They don't get something instead of good instruction. They get good instruction plus. Yellow is additional stuff, not instead of stuff. And there will be some kids who will need highly individualized. When we find that kids don't respond to what we do for everybody and don't respond to the additional stuff we give them, we have identified kids that need individualized interventions. A lot of that will be special ed, but not all of it. That's a small group at the top. Now, how do these percentages line out? It's a guess. But the data that we have over about 20 years suggests that you should be thinking about somewhere between 80 and 85% of your kids should be successful if tier one is working. Your tier two, that means, should be finding between 15 and 20% of your kids. They don't all need big things. Some of them just need you to talk to them. It's that simple, but something. And some of those kids, somewhere in the neighborhood of five or fewer percent, will need that plus an individualized behavior plan. That's the logic of doing this. So if you think about it, the better job we do with tier one, the fewer kids at tier two. The better job we do with tier one and tier two, the fewer kids we have at tier three. That's the whole thing. Prevention first, reaction second. So I like to do this with schools that have never heard of PBAS because it's really concrete, a way to think about prevention. So let's say it's not math or reading or science or health or behavior. Let's say there's a really bad flu going around in your school. Here's what we know about that flu. One, it's contagious. Kids are catching it from one another. Two, you can see it coming. Show me a kid with a low grade fever and I'll show you a kid with a really high probability of a flu coming on. Three, if you catch this flu early, you can fix it. High probability, 80% probability of getting rid of it if you catch it early and treat it with liquids and vitamins. And four, if you don't catch this flu and stop that fever, if that flu fever gets up to 103 or so, you're not gonna stop this flu ever. It's just really unlikely. The only way to fix it now is brain surgery. If that were the case in your school, your first thought would not be, we need to buy scalpels and practice up on surgery techniques. Your first thought would be, I'm a teacher, I work in a school, kids are catching this flu, let's prevent it. And you would talk about things like wash your hands. But here's what I think is really different about PBIS from this. Because people will say when I say this, oh, we already wash our hands in the school. Do you teach the kids? Oh yeah, sure, every day we say, go wash your hands. 
That's not instruction. That's telling them to do something. Anybody with a pulse can tell somebody to do something. It's not teaching. Teachers do things that set the occasion for kids to have a high probability of being successful with those things. I think all of our schools are telling kids to wash their hands. I would bet you none of our schools are teaching kids to wash their hands. Teaching involves, I tell you why it's important. And I ask you to tell me why you think that makes sense. And then we talk about different ways that could happen. And then I model it for you. And I'm very explicit in how I model it. Notice that I use this much soap. I've heard before you're supposed to, I don't know if you even know if this is true. I've heard before that you're supposed to wash your hands while singing happy birthday to yourself twice. Again, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but that would be an explicit rule. Do you think we are teaching hand washing in our schools like that? What if your kids was a life or death flu? Then I think you might say, we probably should teach it. And you'd also teach don't touch your eyes. You'd teach cough into your elbow. You'd teach put your trash where nobody else has to touch it. And this is where PBIS I think is also very unique. PBIS says, you don't know what these things are ahead of time. You gotta look at your kids and say, what would my kids need? And every, every school is unique. So you gotta say, what's weird about our kids? And I know some of you would look at your kids and go, our kids do a lot of licking. I think we're gonna, in our particular school, need to have a tongue in your mouth rule because that's what our kids will do. I don't know what your school is, but I do know that when you look at your school, you're gonna to have to say, where would our kids fail? That's your predictor. Where would our kids fail? Because when you can figure out this is where my kids would fail, then that's where you go to do your prevention. That's why that's there. So, next question. How will I know if a kid is getting this flu? What's my predictor for flu? Low-grade fever. So, whenever we talk data, people wanna get the best, most accurate data possible, which I like the idea of, except if you're gonna do this for every kid, all day, every day, all year, we'd better find something simple. Do you know what the most accurate way is of assessing core body temperature? It is a rectal thermometer. So here's what I'm gonna suggest you do in your school next year. See, I can already tell you don't like what's coming. And here's the way I think you have to think about this. You could assess behavior so intensely, you could go out and get all of those big universal screeners and an MMPI and all these, you could spend your whole year, all day, every day assessing behavior, but what's the point? Where's the time that you're gonna spend teaching and practicing and making them successful? You've gotta make your universal screener so simple that you can all do it in less than 1% of your time. Here's how that might look when we do go here. This is a heat sensitive sticker that you put on the forehead. I have a 25 year old son. When he was little, we had these. This is not something they use in the hospital. It's not very accurate, but it'll give us an index. And it's simple. If you put one of these on every kid in your school, you could simply walk down the hall and notice which kids were at risk. Yellow is at risk. What do I do with kids that are at risk? And again, I would rather have false positives than false negatives. I'd rather you get some extra help when you didn't need it than that you needed it and didn't get any extra help. So I'm gonna set my criteria lower than I think I need to. What's the simplest thing I could do? Well, we know that kids with low grade fevers respond well to liquids and vitamins. So here's what I suggest. If you're in your school and you see a kid with yellow on their forehead thermometer, you send them to the cafeteria and we will pour chicken soup down their throat. It's very cheap. You don't need special training. You don't need to keep data. You don't need permissions. That's where we want to be. So when you think PBIS in your school, what's your chicken soup? 
And it should be, when I notice that it's not working for a kid, I double up the instruction. I go back in, I say it again. We practice it back and forth. We talk about why that's important. There's a little bit extra. And it might just be that what made that work was the relationship I got by talking to you about this. That's where we wanna start, that simple. We aren't gonna do a major intervention on every kid. We couldn't afford it if we wanted to. So if that doesn't work, we start getting bigger. Not working, go up. Why is Tylenol next? I don't know, I just made this up, but I think Tylenol is bigger than chicken soup for a couple of reasons. Main reason, I do need to keep data. I do need parent permission. I probably need the nurse to do this. We can't just send people down the hall throwing Tylenol out. That makes this a bigger intervention, but I use it for fewer kids as we go up that triangle. If that doesn't work, we might go to prescription meds. Notice the difference in prescription meds. Now we've had to go outside the school to get help. More expensive, more people involved, more time consuming, more complicated, but hopefully we're doing it with fewer kids. And the only kids that are getting it are the kids that are indicated. The thing that indicates you need it is non-response. That's kind of where that whole language of response to intervention comes in, is you get an intervention when you demonstrate you haven't responded to the one below that. How do we decide what order they go in? Two things, simplicity and probability. I want the highest probability thing that we can afford to do every time at the bottom and work up from that. There will be kids that don't respond and we're going to have to do other things. And, and honestly, you go into a school and when you go in and look at kids in tier three, they're getting some weird interventions sometimes. And I'll say, why? And they'll say, because nothing else worked. Okay, well, I think that's reasonable at that point, but only at that point. So here's one. I just found this on the internet. It's, let's say that there's a guy that drives around our school and sells these electrodes out of the trunk of his car. And he says, hey, stick these in a kid's nose. They cure the flu. And I say, do you have evidence for this? And he says, yep. So we buy some. Why not do this right here? Well, I've got chicken soup that's free and it works 80% of the time and it doesn't take a lot of people to do it and I don't have to take any data. And then I've got this that's expensive and might work for some kids. It would make no logical sense for us to say, hey, we got a kid that's really at risk of having big failure in their life. What should we do? Let's do something expensive that might not work very well. Nobody would say that makes sense. You'd say, what's the simplest thing we could do right now that gives us the highest probability? The only time we use these things is when absolutely everything else has failed. We are going to need that scalpel. But remember, that scalpel is only there for the kids who truly need it. In my career, I have worked in jails and hospitals for kids with severe emotional behavior disorders, and I'm really glad that we have jails and hospitals, et cetera, for those kids. They need it. Here's the sad part. I know that a lot of the kids that I worked with in those places were in those places because they never got any of this stuff. That's the shame. Our job is to make sure every single kid gets what they need to be successful. And if they're not, that's not our fault. It's our responsibility to try the next thing and do it in a way that maximizes their probability for success. So if you're doing PBIS in your school, you're doing four things. You are predicting when all the kids in your school might have a problem. Who, what, when, where, why, and then you are trying to figure out what you could do to prevent that. And that prevention always comes in three pieces. Rules, the things you teach them to do to make them successful. Routines, the way we set up the schedule and move things around to make that work for kids. And physical arrangements, where I stand and what I say when they walk by me and go by me and how we arrange the furniture, all of that is within our control. We do all of that to make this less likely to happen. And we need consistency to make that happen. When we are inconsistent, everything falls apart. 
I was going through TSA just recently. This just reminded me of that. And I go through and they say, put your shoes in a bucket. So I put my shoes in the bucket, thinking they didn't really need to yell at me about that, but it's TSA, you're not gonna, you can't say anything. So I put my shoes in a bucket and we go. So the next time I go to TSA, I put my shoes in a bucket and the guy yells at me, keep your shoes out of the bucket, they go right on the belt. And all I can think of is these TSA people are clowns. They don't know what they're doing. I can't say that because, you know, I want to get on that airplane. But my thought is that inconsistency means these guys don't know what they're doing. That's what's happening when you're in the school and the kid goes down the hall and one teacher says, do this, and the other one says, do that. And the kids are just going, these guys are just telling me to do stuff because they're on a power trip. There's no point in me following these directions. If you want those directions to be followed, we all have to have the same message. And the message isn't you're doing this because I said so, it's you're doing this because this is what will make your life better. You'll be safer. You'll be more responsible. You'll get more things. It's about you, not me. And then finally, number four, we got to have that data, not because we like data, but because we won't know if what we're doing is working unless we measure it in some way. I like the thermometer on the forehead. Hey, if we're doing this to stop the flu and we all do it, then what we need to know is, are we stopping the flu? Because if we're not, then we're really wasting our time and we should be doing something different. So three big things that I think need to be there when we think about PBIS. One, adults matter. What you do has a giant impact on what kids do, the way we teach the way we interact and have relationships with kids and the way we encourage them, support them, and the way we provide feedback when they do it right and wrong. The, the fact that we do those in one way instead of another is a giant predictor for success. Second, everything we know about PBIS and about changing behavior is, relates back to teaching. Tell them, show them, engage with them, practice with them, talk about it. Don't tell them, teach them, engage them. And finally, some things work better than others. We have to be able to choose those things that give us the best chance of success. And we have to be able to implement those things with kids in a way in which they believe we care. I know that's hard for some people, but the reality is our data tell us if kids don't believe you're doing this for them, they're not gonna do it as well. They're gonna not wanna be involved with it. So even if you don't care, somehow we have to make kids believe we do. And that's what PBIS is. It's us as an entire school saying, how do we all get on the same page and how do we all consistently implement those things that we know maximize probability for kids' success? That's PBIS. As you saw, the logic of PBIS can be clearly explained through four basic steps that comprise the foundation of the three-tiered framework and occur at each of the three tiers. The four steps are identification of predictable failures, development of effective preventative strategies, consistent application, and evaluation of outcomes. Uh, when we did the hotspot activity, we did a faculty meeting um, after school and all grades 6 through 12 teachers and administrators were present. And I think it really opens um, for teachers a lot of eyes because I think when you're in the heat of the moment and you are really in your area all day, you think this is the area of most need. But when you really look at the whole building, you kind of get a big picture of, well, it's not just my area, there's need all over the building. Starting as a classroom teacher, I was in my little bubble and PBIS has really made me think of the entire school. Now I'm really getting into the emotional side of kids. It's been so powerful. I've always felt like I have control of my classroom and my students and you're just kind of secluded in your own room. And since I've had the opportunity to be the PBIS lead, that's given me the chance to share all the PBIS information with everyone in the school and everyone's on the same page, everyone's consistent 
and we can approach behavior in a positive way for the students. One of the things that it did for us was to shift um, from being reactive, where we were all constantly being reactive to behaviors that were occurring, to being more proactive, um, being able to set expectations and be able to make predictions about behaviors and be able to stop those before they occurred. As a middle school teacher, I think PBIS provides a really good foundation for transition for our students, especially those coming into sixth grade from an elementary school. It gives them really core values and specific behaviors that they know we're going to be watching, we're going to be reinforcing, and I think it gives them a blueprint of a way to maneuver through their time in middle school. I think for us it was just family all on the same page, like you know having the same conversations and the same wording with the kids and everybody in the building, so like we were all actually like saying the exact same thing at the same time, just like being co-cohesive co with everybody. And to piggyback off of that, the systems were all the same across the entire school, um, especially we noticed in the hallways and some of those common areas, every single grade level was doing the same thing, and we could positively um, give feedback if they were doing it correctly. Um, so that's kind of where it started in the common areas, and now it's shifting into the classrooms. I think one of the biggest changes for me has been the words I use with students and the way I talk with students and even the way I talk with teachers. Uh, am I speaking to this student or teacher about what we expect from each other? Are we talking about what we want to see from each other? Or am I saying things and expecting them to know or thinking they're going to understand what my expectation was by some other way that I spoke to them? So it has given me the ability to be reflective on how explicit am I being and just stating what it is what I want. That positive behavior, that correct behavior, that um, uh, pursuing of, of the excellence that we want from all of our students and uh, teachers and staff and focusing on are we pursuing that excellence or am I talking indirectly and expecting them just to get that. Predicting behavior in my school really helped identify the times, the periods, the classes, what's going to be a lunchroom when the behavior occurs and we kind of know when to intervene with, with a kid or be in that area before a situation could be good and get to worse or go bad. In my school, um, predicting behavior was helpful, um, particularly going from the first year that we had implemented PBIS to the second year because um, we changed our master schedule and changed some of the school-wide procedures as far as transitions um, and that kind of thing. We, we even changed, actually we changed when kids were getting intervention. Um, based on just kind of the atmosphere of the building at given times of the day. The notion of tiers, or layers of intervention, is based on the fact that what works best for all may not be effective for some. At the school-wide, or primary tier, intervention is largely based on effective teaching, involving the delivery of instruction and the development of positive learning environments. Whether it be academic or behavioral in nature, the highest probability of success involves ensuring that students know how to be successful, being encouraged to do so, and receiving consistent feedback on performance. I always think about the tiered system as um, layers of support. So like it's kind of that cue of, so we have that first layer that's tier one. There may be differentiation. You may do some things within that. There may be redirection and, and that type of thing for that. But then at some point, at one individual students need an extra layer of support. And when that extra layer, and that may come in the form of social groups or of some type of plan within the classroom, um, they add on that extra support. And then you move into the tier three, and those students need several layers of support. They need social groups in that piece, but they may need something outside of that as well. So I always see that tiered system as, as layers. And so it's that kind of my trigger for when I go to tier two is when I need that extra layer that the other 80% don't need. It's that whole system what we do for the whole school. And then our church here, we break down of what, you know, maybe that's just not gonna work for the whole school. We have a pocket of kids that we have to do something different for. And our church three is what we, we have our extreme behaviors that we may have to sit down at a round table and come up with a special plan for them. And when I think of tier two, I think when I'm driving to work, 
I never know what I'm going to get based on the previous day. So I may have seen them, but does that mean I'm going to see them the next day? Not at all. Um, and again, I think that's why it is so difficult because I, you know, all of us always go with the positive and we have a good day and you want to, you know, not reward, but just commend them and verbally say it. And then the next day I see them again. So that tier two is kind of like a roller coaster up and down. You just like, never know. Is that yeah. the ones that you think when you're going to go to school every day, yeah. it's going to be that one? Yeah. <laughs> so. Or two. Your tier two are not your consistent behaviors. They're the ones that might be sporadic or um, not something that you have a regular uh, plan in place for them to where you need to start looking at the environment of what's causing it, what are the antecedents, what are, and, and maybe just put a simple behavior plan in place. I, I think a tattoo, um, as you if you look across the school building, you may have kids who have some of the same issues like the following direction. So you may have a group where you pull them out maybe twice a week or teach them in the environment and give them some skills in that area. It may, it may be a social skills on following directions or get along with others. But it's, it's, for me, that was our tier two uh, at our school. So um, I think it's more of like, it's maybe not an extreme behavior. It's an at-risk student who we want to teach a specific skill to and we pull them out maybe twice or three times a week and collect data on how they're doing with that specific skill. One of the difficult transition times at our school was lunch changes for middle school and high school students. As they were changing lunch, it was always crowded, it was always chaotic, there was just too much activity happening that could lead to things, that did lead to things. Uh, and when we kind of assessed that area and actually looking at the physical space where that was happening and how we could make that better, one of the things we realized is the school had just for years, for some reason, and it was actually a very illogical reason, but just what they had at the time, there were three double doors leading into the cafeteria. And the school for years, just because they had something to prop open the doors, only had the middle section open. And so all the students were going in and out of the middle section in the same, at the same time. Students going in and students coming out all at the same time. So what we decided to do was buy some inexpensive hardware so that we could prop open the two, double, two, the two sets of double doors on the outside and we bought some little signs that said entrance, exit. And we changed the flow of the entrance and exit so as students were going in, they go on one side and they come out the other side. But by actually ex looking at where the hot spot was, examining the physical space that was there, looking at what our options were and realizing we had just done something for years just because it had always been done that way, we were able to make very small adjustments that greatly improved traffic flow, student interactions with each other. They weren't all crowding through the same places. Regardless of how well Tier 2 strategies are implemented, there will be a small group of students for whom nothing prior has been demonstrated to be effective. And these students will require more diagnostic assessment and highly individualized intervention plans as part of a third tier. In the next seven modules, you'll get a chance to see the basic tasks and actions inherent in schoolwide PBIS. Before moving forward, Consider the degree to which people in your school understand PBIS and how you might explain it to them. Think ahead. What are some of the objections people might have and what are your logical responses?